So today we're going to talk about blockchain, um, blockchain technology, and blockchain and, and how it may have application in Africa. So we're going to jump in. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with uh, biographies. I'm actually going to let um, the panelists speak uh, for themselves. And um, to start with, I thought what we would do is, before we jump too far into blockchain, um, to actually explain a little bit or try to get a, a definition um, from the panelists about their kind of very short summary of what, what is blockchain. Uh, so we will start with Kami Waldemarium from IBM, IBM Research Lab. So just to start, Kami, if um, I get all kinds of questions about blockchain, people think it's synonymous with uh, Bitcoin. Um, I get questions from my grandmother to uh, my friends who are investors. So if you were to try to put it in a, a definition of what blockchain is that could cover a span of a lot of people, how would you define blockchain? Uh, thank you uh, for having us here. Uh, so I don't want to take a lot of time, maybe if you allow me, just a little bit I want to unpack it, but okay. it's just what is a blockchain itself it means, yeah, right? Absolutely. So there are actually three uh, major concepts just to, to, I would like to put in people's mind. First one is what you call the asset, right? Everybody knows about asset, right? So an asset is something that can be owned or can be controlled to produce what you call a value, right? So the second concept we have is transaction, right? So an asset uh, will be transformed from one form to another form through what we call a transaction. So a transaction in general is uh, uh, transformed this value onto blockchain or off blockchain into what is called ledger, right? So a ledger is, I think, the concept of ledger should be known by by everyone. I think it was the concept started, I think, how many, 2,000 years ago, it was referred, being used as a, a sort of a bookkeeping uh, 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 of what you call it transactions, right? So the ledger is something what we call is a system of records, right? You keep records in a system of engagement manner in a way that you can refer it later, right? Okay. So now, if you put all these three principles into the, what you call a blockchain, that blockchain is, so you add a few words on top. And of course, and this is all digital. Of course, all digital. So a blockchain is, a blockchain is a shared, immutable ledger for keep tracking of the history of transactions. Right. That's it. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay. Dr. Dr. Sam Yala, I just want to come to you. Uh, Dr. Sam Yala is with us, um, who works at Worldline. Uh, anything to add on how you explain blockchain um, very succinctly and, and simply yeah. as a technology? Yeah, I think that uh, Dr. Kuminis uh, has uh, already uh, given uh, a good explanation. Maybe I can just uh, add. Um, some of the most relevant advantages uh, provided by the blockchain is that uh, due to the fact that the information is, uh, is shared between different um, locations, right. uh, it makes it uh, very difficult to, to forge, uh, to, um, to, uh, um, to change it without uh, that the other participant of the system can, uh, can know that. So uh, this is really one of, uh, so the technology behind uh, blockchain, as uh, you said, I'm working for uh, Worldline, which is an uh, e-payment uh, transaction company. Uh, it's a, uh, an ethos company. Um, and um, we, are, we are implementing uh, blockchain technology. Uh, of course, now we are um, in the, let's say, uh, proof of concept <laughs> uh, because blockchain is not really uh, um, used uh, uh, in mass. But uh, let's, I want just to emphasize that uh, the fact uh, that uh, the information is shared, um, so there is no single point of failure, and um, this makes the system very robust and difficult to forge. So why don't we go uh, a little bit 
a little bit in reverse of biography. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe a couple of examples of how you specifically have worked with blockchain? You mentioned that. Um, and, and if that's starting to apply to Africa, um, give us a little background on that. Um, actually, my, um, my background is more currently uh, based in, um, uh, as I said, I'm working uh, for Worldline uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, so most of the examples that I have uh, are from uh, um, this location. Um, and uh, last year, for example, we, we uh, Worldline uh, Ethos uh, organized uh, a contest uh, with uh, students coming from different universities, college, and from all over the world. And uh, then uh, three of the teams uh, has been uh, awarded, and uh, um, the, the applications uh, that were really uh, impressive uh, were, for example, one of the team, I think that it was a team from the MIT University, um, they, um, uh, they've implemented a system to, uh, based on the blockchain technology to, uh, to prevent the, the botnet attacks. So when connected devices are um, interacting, they are exchanging data and so on, there is a very known attack uh, that is called uh, botnet, uh, okay. that robot network. And using the blockchain uh, principles, uh, it, um, yeah, it makes the system more robust. And um, there were also um, uh, other applications, uh, for example, in the, in the insurance uh, sector uh, to show how the blockchain technology can um, provide, can increase the, um, the confidence and the truth um, in the insurance uh, industry. So there are a lot of examples uh, where we are um, trying to, uh, to introduce uh, this technology. Of course, we are, uh, let's say, in the proof of concept stage now. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that's the case for, uh, I think, most of uh, the companies today. Yeah. So you guys are, are definitely headed in the right direction in terms of blockchain and data privacy, data security, yeah. uh, which is, as we know, front and center in today's global tech world. We'll come back to that. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, what you've been working on in particular with um, blockchain, uh, with IBM, IBM Research, and maybe a few examples of, uh, of how it's had application or how it might have application uh, here in Africa. Right, thank you. So uh, I think uh, uh, just be, 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 be before going that, I want to just a little bit to demystify uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, right? Which is important for people to understand what is, uh, right? So then they would appreciate actually what is actually a blockchain? It yeah. means that like, how a blockchain could be used in some sense to save lives and to transfer governments, to basically provide, uh, to make citizens even closer to the, to the government and, and also addressing fundamental problem on the data. And uh, now you see that there's a movement of what we call it, how do you really explain in the artificial intelligence world, the, the artificial intelligence systems are actually learning from the data, but that data cannot be trusted, and then using that trusted, yeah, untrusted or semi-trusted information to make decisions, right? So, so you find that the blockchain is is almost synonymously connected to fintech and, and the payments world. Yeah, it's in many people's minds, even though that's not the case. So I, I, I'll come back to that. Okay. So I have been, uh, we have been the premier in, in working in the blockchain world for the last four years, right? So. Uh, so uh, I, I'm primarily leading a number of projects on blockchain from digital identities. Like uh, you know, that uh, as in Africa, I mean, uh, over uh, half a billion people being so left behind having actual digital identity. Because of that, they are right. being left for getting basic uh, services like for education, uh, healthcare, and even insurances and all the financial inclusion services in general, right? So we have been working on digital identity. How do you really create a decentralized digital identity by putting, of course, the, the government into 
into the bigger play, into the creating this what you call the digital identities of ecosystem to enable fundamental services for the citizenship, which is okay. education. So we have been seeing a lot of problems in education. Well, it's a teacher, ghost teachers being reported, ghost students being reported, and uh, examination being uh, being reported as a fraud, and lots of lots of problems across the education sector, right? So. So the key to unlock such problems is actually to have a digital identity and then build solutions on top of that one, right? The second problem, the biggest one we do, uh, and uh, what you call it in the cross-border trade area, right? So trade is, uh, uh, you know, Africa, uh, let me give, give you an example, a very good example of uh, in the trade. So do you know how many people involve when you ship avocado from Kenya to Notre Dame? For example, right? So many, many, right? Yeah. So just to give you a, a sense to appreciate the problem, so there are more than 31 actors involved. The actors being authorities, shippers, important exporters. More than 100 people, actual people, being involved, and then more than 200 information being shared for just shipping avocado from out of. Uh, Mombasa port to the, the port of Notre Dame, right? I mean, I can give you a lot of uh, detail. Because of this, in general, from the sense of the cross-border trade, Africa is being left behind. And if you just solve, so in, in the trade world you have is what you call is the movement of the actual goods right. and the movement of the documents, right? So this, the combination of movement of goods and movement of documents costing actually over 65, $67 billion, right? So just inefficiencies. If you just fix the paperless part, and then with some sort of, of the shipment information, you could actually save over $27 billion, so which is injecting back to the economy, right? So you guys have been working on... Yeah, so uh, we have been working... Something like, to do that? We are actually... So it would be a digital ledger for, for trade transactions? Exactly. Actually, okay. it's already done, and it's uh, uh, in the production. We have been partner with the Mask Line Shipment. Uh, it's got now the joint venture. It's okay. a public information you can get. So but it, to appreciate, it started actually from our herd, from Kenya. Yeah. Right, so yeah. now the, how global scale could be solving what we call the cross-border trades, right? So another, another example we're working on in the insurance industries, in the healthcare data sharing, and the, uh, we're working on the food safety, right? So what we call the farm to farm problem, right? So how do you really ensure food actually get into the people's mouths by tracing back the origin? Right, okay. So connecting the physical world to the virtual world, and then everybody can know actually where the food comes from, what kind of consequences could be, how that food being treated, and then that I, I could go on and on uh, on these problems. Like what the other big problem <laughs> that's related to agriculture, right? So, so, so a couple, a couple quick questions, and then um, I want to come back to Dr. Yala. So, just kind of a nut and bolt question. So where this technology that's regulating these trade transactions, just to get slightly technical, where does it exist? Is it, is it an API in an IBM cloud somewhere? Like, where, where is the blockchain that actually regulates this trade case that you're talking about? So, um, you know, how trade works, right? Yeah. Is, uh, uh, it works actually based on a collaboration between the traders and authorities and the right. shippers, all the entire ecosystem, right? So where it lives on the IBM, uh, uh, as part of like the Linux Foundation, we have the Hyperledger project, right? Which is uh, the open source one of well, one of the biggest contributor in the open source code for the Hyperledger. So uh, that's to be very clear that it's for the businesses, right? Okay. So a blockchain for the businesses where the identity. Uh, over anonymity kind of thing, right? So identity of the participant in the network is down. So in the, when it comes to the trade context, what you have, trade happens between entities, right? So right. that entity basically what you call the workflow of a trade, like shipping avocado means the workflow of avocado that involves that getting six documents, you have the FIRO sign, the bill of leading, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the document and every involving participant in that uh, uh, shipment lane has to endorse the transactions. So the, trans the, the, the system lives into distributed uh, network, of course, in the, in the, on top of the hyperledger 
uh, 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 fabric, right? So, but the solution of this, what we call a blockchain, the cross-border uh, platform, lives in the, in the network of these nodes, right? The nodes be controlled by the authorities, by the shippers, and uh, by endorsed uh, uh, actors in the blockchain. So, okay. I can go on and on. And and just on. very quickly, so this, would this have application toward, just to bring it into a local news context, toward this latest um, Pan-African trade agreement? Could it have cost implicate or cost benefits or actually uh, you know, benefit some of the trade that's gonna come out of that agreement? So uh, uh, I would like this, my personal statement, not an uh, IBM statement. Uh, you see, that's the, the, there's a fundamental concern that is connecting uh, entities through the blockchain. In this particular case of the cross-border trade is actually that was a mission. How do you really connect Africa? Right. So connecting Africa in a leisure in such a way that every transactions and every movement of asset happening, first you eliminate the bad guys, which is basically you ensure transparency. Second, you reduce cost because why would you, the shipping, sending a document across traditional courier services, an average cost $200. Why would you pay? Right? That it reduces the cost, improves efficiency, which is nearly in real time, and also variability, immutability, all the properties he mentioned, right? Yeah. So, and then this is done through what you call a consensus. Right? All the parties involved in this has to agree now. If you look at now the, the one-stop shop problem the, uh, approach we have in the trade agreement, the solution what we have now, of course, something to be added uh, around the artificial intelligence problems to be using those data, the data being in the leisure to do more uh, derivatives and more of uh, decision making on top of the trusted data. Actually, I would say a perfect starting point to connect and enable and endorse uh, uh, such uh, partnership. Well, personal thought, but it sounds like an opportunity for, uh, for IBM's research lab in African trade, but I'm sure you guys will decide on that. Um, shifting back, and uh, thanks, Kami. Uh, shifting back to security, so obviously there's application for blockchain technology uh, in Africa for many things. Um, you're dealing with digital systems, and uh, we've seen, um, unfortunately for my country, we've seen some problems in securing digital systems. Uh, anything on how blockchain could, you mentioned some of these uh, applications your company had, we're actually toward using blockchain to improve yeah. data security, but also, is there another level, like a blind spot? How do you, how do you protect the security of the blockchain information? Yeah, so uh, uh, actually, before going uh, to this question, maybe I will add something uh, regarding the cost savings that uh, Dr. Kominis talked about. Um, there are some figures uh, coming from the global uh, financial sector uh, saying that, um, it's a figure from uh, only last year, that uh, the one, one of the, the uh, to adopt blockchain, uh, the, the financial uh, sector um, has uh, made a uh, study and uh, it's uh, proven that uh, we can save up to uh, 20 billion uh, US dollar per year, so the adoption of the blockchain is something that will, of course, come naturally. So, so 20 billion in, in what context? In the, uh, in the context that uh, we, uh, we reduce. Like we can globally or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so uh, yeah, the, the financial sector in the sense that um, the, the cost of transactions, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, the fraud is uh, reduced and so on, so globally. Uh, so it's a uh, 20 billion dollar, and um, another point uh, maybe I would like to uh, uh, something that I would like to, to point out is uh, and that is very important for uh, our continent Africa is um, the uh, the aspect of uh, the energy aspect behind the blockchain okay. it, it, uh, because as you know um, uh, in the technology. Uh, there, there are what we call uh, proof of work and so on, and that is something that is really uh, consuming a lot of energy. And uh, I think that um, uh, the, if we, we refer to the Bitcoin only, uh, it's not specific to Bitcoin, but 
uh, the, the energy uh, consumption for the current big chain implementation uh, is about uh, 4 gigawatt, okay. which is enormous. So this is also one of the challenges that uh, we have to, to tackle in Africa um, if we want to, uh, uh, to have this technology really uh, implemented uh, and uh, so on. So this is really something to, uh, to have in mind. Okay. But, uh, so uh, maybe uh, um, some other protocols, and I, would, I can uh, ask to my colleague, uh, Dr. Communist. Uh, so maybe um, uh, instead of doing uh, proof of works and uh, so on, maybe you can do some, let's say, uh, less um, constraint, uh, constraint protocol to have less energy consumption. Uh, I think glad you brought that up, right? So, so that's uh, the, where uh, it comes from the uh, public versus private blockchain, right? So, so uh, in the private world, or even in the open blockchain concept, what we call these um, uh, smart contracts, right? So smart contracts are uh, pro software programs that actually live with the data; they move across. So rather than you're addressing crazy mathematical uh, formula, which is the proof of uh, work in the context of uh, the uh, cryptocurrencies, so what you do in, 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 a, in a smart contract world is basically you are validating the smart contract. The smart contract is actually a specification or the requirement of how you do a business, right? It could, right. Depending on the, the use case you are working on, if, when it's a trade, a trade um, uh, workflow, which is a co smart co a contract being defined between the participating entities. When you talk about identity, the same. When you talk about healthcare, so each has its own protocol, which is uh, specified under what we call the smart contract. So that basically, it's, you can use the normal con computer you have, even your phone. For you don't need to mine. You don't need to. To, to solve that crazy proof of work equation, right? Uh, so I think we need to distinguish uh, 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 cryptocurrency as a portion of the African problem, right? Right. So I, I would like actually us to discuss more often what are actually the fundamental problems that we are suffering in Africa, right? So. Is it really only a, a, a currency problem we have? I mean, there are also different variations of implementations through tokens now that, without requiring uh, the proof of work. It's now coming up so in a very nice way. And smart contract app, which is another uh, way, which is, could be in the, in, the, in the case of Ethereum, for example, it's quite good. If you look at the hyperledger community, again, without requiring that uh, solving that proof of work, you could right. just execute uh, what you call the smart contracts. So the power issue. Also, I will sometimes I see also in the Bitcoin world, the consumption of power actually. Um, creating a very, very, very novel research angle, actually, for people who are working on uh, how to renewable energy side, right? How to actually use the generated energy coming out of from the mining back to the energy pipeline. Okay. So how do you do? There are a lot of actual research agenda being now uh, endorsed. Uh, we need to see in the next uh, few years, but there's also an opportunity uh, for uh, how do you really use back our uh, uh, energy being generated, but the consumption, how do you actually manage even the consumption? It's a lot to be done. Still, I don't think it's well understood so far, but uh, we need to invest more scientific um, understanding on, on that. Bit. Okay, so, so extending, um, extending on blockchain and the different applications it could have for Africa, logistics, obviously payments, education, energy. Um, what I'd like to ask in, in security, just to try to make it a little more concrete for people, what would be some monetizable commercial products that would come out of this? Because we're talking very broadly about the technology, but I, I think that helps put things in the context as to where, where does this come into a product? Um, is it something developed by a startup? And also, I think almost everything has to be monetized in some way or another. Um, and I, mean, I give one example on remittances. You know, I did a story on SureRemit that's created 
they're using blockchain technology to, to create these crypto tokens to reduce the remittance costs um, and create a, a new kind of currency for um, you know, doing transactions in Africa. But in any case, where, where does blockchain come into a monetizable commercial product? And maybe in your case, it's, yeah, it's uh, security it's, applications. Yeah. I don't know exactly if um, it's uh, the, um, the most relevant case, but I uh, just mention it, is uh, in Africa, uh, most people are talking about, uh, you know, in the, in the land register. Right. Uh, so um, today, um, the land register is uh, something that is uh, handled manually and so on. So properties and deeds yes. and things like that? And okay. so uh, we believe that uh, the blockchain technology uh, can really bring um, uh, security yeah. and also uh, uh, trust in this specific domain. Okay. And um, so I think that the application of, of, uh, of blockchain is, uh, is um, limitless, <laughs> uh, endless. And um, um, well, w one, one of the, the most known one is uh, bitcoins, of course, uh, uh, which is getting uh, uh, people who invested in the past in the bitcoins uh, are very happy today because uh, <laughs> they have a very nice uh, return on, on investment. Uh, um, but I think that uh, in, in the sector of uh, yeah, the land register in Africa is something that can really bring, yeah. And are you, for example, this startup that you mentioned that's developed a data security platform using blockchain, is that something that, that you guys would sell as a company or contract out um, as a service? Actually, uh, we have our own product and uh, this one that I mentioned is, was uh, in the uh, in the um, context uh, with uh, uh, students uh, and so on. Okay. And uh, now we, we offer them uh, opportunity to, uh, to go further okay. in, uh, in their work. And maybe uh, in the next uh, uh, NEF session, <laughs> I will give more details about okay. that. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, Kami, I want to come back to you and, and maybe go a little bit off that last question. And um, this is something I, I like to do in all my Africa tech reporting is uh, not to overlook the application of African tech to the continent, but where could some of these localized solutions not just have application pan-Africanally, but is there, are there some things that, some challenges that are being presented to blockchain here that could actually create um, systems or applications that would have relevance globally? Any, any examples you can think of? Yeah, uh, so one of course, uh, example of trade, uh, yeah. uh, digital identities. And so you think like the EU or, or other yes. trade regions could use yeah, some of this? Yeah, okay. partly in our, we did actually uh, uh, what they call uh, live shipment uh, out of the Notre Dame to the U.S., right? Okay. So a platform is just universal. It, it doesn't limit you, uh, there is no boundary, right? So I mean, the protocol, so always we believe in this concept what called uh, low cost, high value solutions, right? right? Low cost in the sense that it serves our purpose here and a high value in the sense when you move to another geography with a little bit advanced one, just flip the business model, right? So uh, uh, I would like to actually uh, uh, come to that later, but uh, uh, so one thing which is interesting now what uh, we are working on is called kind of data, right? So a blockchain is about trusted authenticity data, right? So if you look at across the every sector, the healthcare, be it uh, agriculture, be it education, what is common? Right. The common is actually about, uh, it's in all these different verticals, is what they call the document, right? The document moves from places to places. So we, we built this, what we call is a distributed uh, blockchain secure doc store. It, I don't care about this document is a trade document. I don't care this document is a tra uh, identity document. I don't care this uh, financial application retailer. But I will give you APIs in a way that you can use or reprogram my APIs okay. to manage your document on the, the ledger, right? So. And you see, those kind of uh, 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 high, low value, uh, low cost and high value 
APIs that can be programmed by a startup, a locally born startup. How do you actually bring those startups to use such APIs to build local solutions and then a global scale, right? Okay. So that's the way now it comes to the cloud into play and the APIs into to putting together. And then now using that one, building these AI machines, right, that uses this trusted data to make trusted decisions, right? How do you make those AI uh, models uh, accessible through APIs in such right. a way that the local community can build on top of that one to do novel solutions from be it land problems you're uh, solving, it will be the education problem you're solving, it could be it's a financial survey or retail finance you're solving in all dimensions, but how do you really, rather than replicate it again and again, build such models, such APIs, based on the trusted data, based on reprogrammed models, and then learning from the trusted data, right? And then accessible through APIs to the entire community. Solving a local problem can be replicated elsewhere, like take an example of M-Pesa, and now take an example of a trade. Right. So the, the questions you you at IBM you're working on those questions and yes we'll we'll get the answers hopefully sometime yeah see, um, and doing this one one, one of the, the, the interesting problem what we are saying we always ask ourselves sort of tough questions right one one question we're talking about Africa's resource constraint right right so what is is anybody is thinking about offline blockchain we are we are living in a, a place where we don't have even connectivity. What does it mean, a blockchain in the offline world? Right. Can you do it? Uh, these are the kind of things like, the, yes, we are talking about like uh, remittances. Uh, what would be that remittance for my, my grandmom? She lives in, in, in a rural community. Can we enable her, actually? And also the other problem is that now you have seen in Europe like the data protection is the key, right? So data, it belongs to the people. How do you make that notion concept possible on a blockchain, human-controlled check and balances, so it's called a policy-driven data access and sharing on a blockchain, which is ideally what do you see in, in our continent. Uh, to, uh, how do you explain that to the people? How do you explain yeah. that to your grandmother? Well, I think the ideal solution would be just to get everybody connected, but that takes time. How are you going? I mean, but I, I know there are a lot of there are a lot of techno technological apps in Africa. Like you run into, what's the baseline for almost any tech anything you do in tech startup? It's connectivity, right? So, so how you do run you into do that challenge? Th that's good, actually. The challenge for us is, as a researcher, a scientist, a challenge for us is always an opportunity. What kind of novel solutions you build to people still access where they are offline? Yeah. And so I know that, that, that there are some um, entities like Netflix and the VOD platforms that have developed ways to stream or to download things faster and cheaper based on the problem that a lot of people here either don't have connectivity or it's very right. expensive. And I know some of that's been applied um, to other parts of the world based on things that these startups have developed here. Right. So right. Um, we have time for some Q&A. And I, I think I want to prompt a little Q&A as we we missed one key possible area in Africa um, for blockchain benefits, and that was, that was healthcare. Uh, but if somebody has a question on that, that's great. But um, we'll take questions. So what I would ask is uh, raise your hand, and if you could just say quickly who you are. And uh, one thing just to, to say is please you know, ask a question. Um, I, I love speeches, but um, here we want to get as much from the panelists as we possibly can. So why don't we start with the lady right here. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Ugeneza. I, I work with Rwanda Information Society Authority. <coughs> I have three questions. Number one, um, we have seen that uh, blockchain technology uh, will allow people to keep the same uh, ledger, let's say ledger, distributed to each user into the, let's say, the circle of that uh, uh, specific area being applied that technology. Uh, you've talked about uh, the issue of uh, energy consumption. How about uh, the memory? Because uh, each time that that ledger is updated, it will uh, automatically be affected to each and every ledger being kept by each individual in the block. So how about the e 
the issue of memory and how do you see that uh, tackled? The Can second we do one question? Because I just want to give everybody as much time as possible. Oh, please, the I have an in, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, The second one is, uh, <clears throat> let's say, the example of uh, um, product shipment from, let's say, Africa to Europe through that uh, uh, channel. Uh, what is required from each user? Let's say uh, the person producing uh, avocados. What is he required as an end user to keep track of? Uh, those products from uh, production till shipment, what is required from each specific uh, user playing the role in the chain in terms of technology and devices to be able to keep track of that. Thank okay. you. So, Dr. Yala, would you like to take number one? And Kami, I think number two would apply to you. Yeah, uh, for the first question, um, I think uh, this is, um, yeah, uh, in inherent, uh, so uh, it's intrinsic to uh, the technology, uh, and I'm afraid that we, there is nothing that uh, today, at least uh, with uh, the current technology, that can be done, uh, in the sense that, uh, by definition, uh, it's a distributed ledger, and uh, each time that uh, people who are involved in, uh, in the system, uh, if something changes in, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, if a block changes, then um, this must be uh, distributed uh, toward all the people involved, and this has uh, some implication on energy consumption and also memory. Um, so for this part, um, unless a new technology uh, is built in the future, um, I'm afraid that uh, this uh, will still apply, unfortunately, and uh, this kind of uh, issue uh, of course, uh, the, um, the the computers. Uh, we hope that uh, they will get more and more memory and so on uh, to keep the tracks of uh, of all the records. Uh, but uh, also, uh, maybe it's uh, um, yeah. We can say that maybe in the future other technology will come, and that will maybe uh, be based on uh, something else that uh, what we know today as blockchain. But with the current blockchain, is uh, Something. Uh, Thank you. And yeah. Kami, it was on, on yeah. avocado. Uh, I think the second yeah. question was on some of the mechanics of right. the, the trade and in, in the export import. Yeah. Uh, let me maybe add on what I think currently, uh, uh, why we would like to keep on the memory? It's why we would like to keep the ledger in the memory? You don't need to keep in the memory, it's kept in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the storage, right? So the memory, I mean, uh, of course, you don't need to keep the entire ledger on your uh, uh, even storage, right? So it can live anywhere as long as you actually validate. And the memory is basically and the memory. The memory use for doing the. Uh, the farmer is a, a brilliant question. What the farmer is needed to have is just any individual device and connect it to, to the system, to individual application. It's such simple. So we get one more question. And this, I have to go to this journalistic crew here that asked me in advance to ask a question. Thank you very much. I'm Bina Charles. I'm a reporter for this session. I just wanted to ask, in terms of regulations, which angle are the governments using to put in place regulations about blockchain? So both, both panelists? So I guess the, que the question is going back to what, what usually you get into what should governments do a lot, a little, or, or try to stay out of the way is kind of where these things go um, on regulation. Yeah. Uh, what can I say about that? Um, yeah, of course, for the adoption. So today, uh, one of the applications of uh, the blockchain is uh, the bitcoins, uh, of course. And uh, one of the questions raised is to know whether, for example, uh, the bitcoins will uh, replace the, um, uh, the normal money <laughs> that we are using today. And uh, some people are saying, OK, it could be. Other people are saying it will never happen. And one of the reasons that uh, 
before uh, this kind of applications, so uh, bitcoins uh, based on uh, blockchain, can replace uh, the, the fiat uh, the, uh, money, um, is that uh, it must have the full support of uh, the government. And, um, and there are other aspects uh, where uh, some, um, yeah, for whatever reasons, uh, uh, people of uh, officials can be reluctant on that. So today, um, yeah, the, the technology is evolving, the technology is, uh, is being deployed, uh, and uh, I think that um, um, the, some, uh, some initiatives are taken to, um, to regulate, uh, to enforce, uh, and so on, but we are still far from uh, a full uh, regulated uh, um, system, let's say that. And I just want to point that, just jumping off from that quickly to direct the question a little bit more. Uh, Kami, are there any examples, I, I think maybe Kenya has one, but any quick examples you can say of where governments or even pan-Africanly, the African Union, has started to delve into how do we regulate uh, blockchain technology on the continent? Uh, I'm not aware, but uh, I would like to comment. Uh, okay. um, so just I would like to pose this question for the audience as well, all right? So have we regulated, um, let's say, database tools? Have, In the whole continent or? And globally. Have we regulated, <laughs> let's say, let me use a little bit low-level example, let's say DB2 or... or C++, have we regulated? So I think what is happening is that uh, we tend to mix things. Like, uh, like regulations are important because they set policies. So how do we really help uh, the regulators with the right tools and in a way that converting those regulations to what I call the compliance checks and that can be embedded as part of the blockchain system to do checks at the transactional level, at the data level, and also at even uh, at the movement level, right? So the thing is that there are actually technologies now evolving to help regulators and the government to be part of this uh, revolutionary, uh, in, the, in the revolution where we are living, to them to actually get the right visibility, what they call, right? So how can we provide for the regulators, the governments, the right level of visibility using tools, right? So that's where it comes to a play. Do we have the right regulations in place? Regulating what, I don't know. But can we give them uh, uh, multidimensional eyes in such a way that they can actually see what is happening, what is getting in, getting out, which is the inbound and outbound problems, right? When we ship currently, wouldn't it be better for the regulators to see what is being shipped, in what condition, who shipped, which kind of banks involved for the letter of credit? So, but fundamentally, you're you're answering a question that the private sector should actually help the government. Help, help the government. Yes. Well, I I think that's a we can conclude on that yeah. um, because I think from uh, from what we've seen in other tech sectors where uh, the approach was we should just have hands off all the way and that hasn't quite worked. That that's potentially an advancement in in thinking here in Africa. So, unfortunately, we have to conclude. Um, I want to thank uh, Next Einstein Forum. And let's thank our panelists, Dr. Yala, Walter Merriam. And that concludes the blockchain panel. Thank you very much. Thank you all, panelists and speakers. Um, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the next session. We will be heading to the plenary uh, hall where we were in the morning for the next uh, special session taking place now. So if you could just kind of make your way to Gasabo Plenary Hall, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.